Sections twenty eight to thirty of How to Sing. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Ruth Golding. How to Sing by Lily Lehman. Translated by Richard Aldrich. Section twenty eight. Resonant Consonants. K, L, M, N, P, S, R, and T at the end of a word or syllable must be made resonant by joining to the end of the word or syllable a rather audible E. Eh. For instance, Vandelle, Gretelle, etc. A thing that no one teaches any longer, or knows or is able to do. A thing that only Betts and I knew, and with me will probably disappear entirely, is the dividing and ending of syllables that must be effected under certain conditions. It may have originated with the Italian school. I was taught it especially upon double consonants. When two come together, they must be divided, the first as in himmel, being sounded dull and without resonance, the syllable and tone being kept as nasal as possible, the lips closed, and a pause being made between the two syllables. Not till then is the second syllable pronounced, with a new formation of the second consonant. And this is done not only in case of a doubling of one consonant, but whenever two consonants come together to close the syllable. For instance, winter, dringen, klingen, binden. In these the nasal sound plays a specially important part. The tediousness of singing without proper separation of the syllables is not appreciated till it has been learned how to divide the consonants. The nasal close of itself brings a new colour into the singing, which must be taken into account, and moreover the word is much more clearly intelligible, especially in large auditoriums, where an appreciable length of time is needed for it to reach the listener. By the nasal close also an uninterrupted connection is assured between the consonant and the tone, even if the latter has to cease, apparently, for an instant. I teach all my pupils thus, but since most of them consider it something unheard of to be forced to pronounce in this way, they very rarely bring it to the artistic perfection which alone can make it effective. Except from Betts, I have never heard it from any one. After me, no one will teach it any more. I shall probably be the last one. A pity. End of section 28 Section 29 Practical Exercises The practical study of singing is best begun with single sustained tones, and with preparation on the sound of ah alone, mingled with o oh and oo. A position as if one were about to yawn helps the tongue to lie in the right place. In order not to weary young voices too much, it is best to begin in the middle range, going upward first by semitones, and then, starting again with the same tone, going downward. All other exercises begin in the lower range and go upward. The pupil must first be able to make a single tone good and judge it correctly, before he should be allowed to proceed to a second. Later, single syllables or words can be used as exercises for this. The position of the mouth and tongue must be watched in the mirror. The vowel R must be mingled with O and O, and care must be taken that the breath is forced strongly against the chest, and felt attacking here and on the palate at the same time. Begin piano make a decrescendo, then a crescendo slowly, and gradually return and end on a well-controlled piano. My feeling at the attack is as shown in the plate. 
at the same instant that I placed the tone under its highest point on the palate, I let the overtones soar above the palate, the two united in one thought. Only in the lowest range can the overtones, and in the highest range the undertones, resonance of the head cavities and of the palate, be dispensed with. With me, the throat never comes into consideration. I feel absolutely nothing of it, at most only the breath gently streaming through it. A tone should never be forced, never press the breath against the resonating chambers, but only against the chest, and never hold it back. The organs should not be cramped, but should be allowed to perform their functions elastically. The contraction of the muscles should never exceed their power to relax. A tone must always be sung, whether strong or soft, with an easy, conscious power. Further, before all things, sing always with due regard to the pitch. In this way, the control of the ear is exercised over the pitch, strength, and duration of the tone and over the singer's strength and weakness, of which we are often forced to make a virtue. In short, one learns to recognize and to produce a perfect tone. In all exercises, go as low and as high as the voice will allow without straining, and always make little pauses to rest between them, even if you are not tired, in order to be all the fresher for the next one. With a certain amount of skill and steady purpose, the voice increases its compass, and takes the proper range, easiest to it by nature. The pupil can see, then, how greatly the compass of a voice can be extended. For amateurs it is not necessary, but it is for everyone who practices the profession of a singer in public. For a second exercise, Sing connectedly two half-tones, slowly, on one or two vowels, bridging them with the auxiliary vowels and the y as the support of the tongue, etc. Every tone must seek its best results from all the organs concerned in its production, must possess power, brilliancy, and mellowness in order to be able to produce, before leaving each tone, the propagation form for the next tone, ascending as well as descending, and make it certain. No exercise should be dropped till every vibration of every tone has clearly approved itself to the ear not only of the teacher, but also of the pupil, as perfect. It takes a long time to reach the full consciousness of a tone. After it has passed the lips, it must be diffused outside, before it can come to the consciousness of the listener, as well as to that of the singer himself. So practice singing slowly, and hearing slowly. End of section 29 Section 30 The Great Scale this is the most necessary exercise for all kinds of voices. It was taught to my mother. She taught it to all her pupils and to us. But I am probably the only one of them all who practices it faithfully. I do not trust the others. As a pupil, one must practice it twice a day. As a professional singer, at least once. The breath must be well prepared the expiration still better, for the duration of these five and four long tones is greater than would be supposed. Soprano Breath Breath. Breath.
the first tone is positively attacked and by the relaxation of the diaphragm immediately after the attack is diminished that is it is made supple as the breath is then decreased all the other vocal organs take up this relaxation and so become elastic the so controlled breath may now completely fill up its tone form as long and as strong as one wishes to make the tone yet an excessive crescendo is ugly and inartistic it is due to the transformed energy into elasticity which the attack requires that a pushing of the breath and a rigid contraction of the organs need not be feared any longer but one must always remember to make the organ as nose palate tongue larynx and diaphragm after every energetic attack pliable and elastic by relaxing the diaphragm then without particularly swelling the tone that is making a crescendo the singer must try in order to progress to mentally shape the propagation form for the next tone the thought must precede the act a long time after having fixed the pitch the diaphragm and with it all the other organs are again relaxed and so forced to be pliable without altering the form which ensures to the sustained tone its existence to the last moment lift nose palate tongue with the thoughts dwelling on e and a and push the new form already mentally changed with an energetic but elastic a position of the larynx in a place created for the next tone if the pitch which unites e and a is secured then the larynx places itself immediately under the tongue on o that is it becomes pliable for new and elastic processes ah Now only can the second tone also become perfect. Before and after every change of tone and letter, all the mentioned processes are renewed. Every first phrase of the great scale ends with nasal resonance in the middle range, that is, covered. The second higher phrase is covered too, but towards the forehead and head cavities. The lowest tone must already be prepared to favour the resonance of the head cavities, that is, the head voice. It is possible, when E is already placed very high, to proceed on O. That would mean to help with the diaphragm. Or when the diaphragm and larynx are already very elastically united on O, to proceed on E, or on E and A which would mean to further the progressive motion and change of tone form by means of the nose, palate, and tongue. The larynx adjustment, A, closely connected to the nose position, E, which also results each time in the re-lifting of the epiglottis, is and remains the substance of the tone. By means of it occurs the shifting of the form toward the top and toward the bottom, which act unites to a central point the tones and the position of the organs, but which, without the y, the elastic hinge, would not bring about a connection in the tone progression, nor between the relaxation of the old form and the creation of the new. It is really only a tone centre. But this focal point must, in an elastic state, 
be of service to every form movement, and may, in cases where the nose, palate, tongue, or diaphragm operate less actively, be made use of more energetically than would otherwise be necessary in a normal state. It would mean to give stronger expression to A than to E or U. There are many singers who produce velocity solely with A, with a wobbling larynx which acts alone, disunited to nose, palate, or diaphragm. Their tones, instead of being connected one with the other as with a band, tumble out singly. This sort of coloratura, which we used to jokingly call cluckeratura, is wretched, and has nothing in common with the art of song. When O, A, and E are auxiliary vowels, they need not be plainly pronounced. They form an exception in the diphthongs traum, laid, laun, foia, etc. As auxiliary vowels, they are only means to an end, a bridge, a connection from one thing to another. They can be taken anywhere with any other sound, and thence it may be seen how elastic the organs can be when they are skilfully managed. The chief object of the great scale is to secure the pliant form and the sustained use of the breath, precision in the preparation of the propagation form, the proper mixture of the vowels which aid in placing the organs in the right position for the tone to be changed for every different tone, although imperceptibly. Further, the intelligent use of the resonance of the palate and head cavities, especially the latter, whose tones, soaring above everything else, form the connection with the nasal quality for the whole scale. The scale must be practised without too strenuous exertion, but not without energy gradually extending over the entire compass of the voice, and that is, if it is to be perfect, over a compass of two octaves. These two octaves will have been covered when, advancing the starting point by semitones, the scale has been carried up through an entire octave. So much every voice can finally accomplish, even if the high notes must be very feeble. The great scale, properly elaborated in practice, accomplishes wonders. It equalizes the voice, makes it flexible and noble, gives strength to all weak places, operates to repair all faults and breaks that exist, and controls the voice to the very heart. Nothing escapes it. By it, ability as well as inability is brought to light something that is extremely unpleasant to those without ability. In my opinion, it is the ideal exercise, but the most difficult one I know. By devoting forty minutes to it every day, a consciousness of certainty and strength will be gained that ten hours a day of any other exercise cannot give. This should be the chief test in all conservatories. If I were at the head of one, the pupils should be allowed for the first three years to sing at the examinations only difficult exercises like this great scale, before they should be allowed to think of singing a song or an aria, which I regard only as cloaks for incompetency. For teaching me this scale, this guardian angel of the voice, I cannot be thankful enough to my mother. In earlier years I used to like to shirk the work of singing it, there was a time when I imagined that it strained me. My mother often ended her warnings at my neglect of it with the words, You will be very sorry for it. And I was very sorry for it. At one time, when I was about to be subjected to great exertions, and did not practice it every day, but thought it was enough to sing coloratura fireworks, I soon became aware that my transition tones would no longer endure the strain began easily to waver, or threatened even to become too flat. The realization of it was terrible. It cost me many, many years of the hardest and most careful study, 
and it finally brought me to realize the necessity of exercising the vocal organs continually, and in the proper way, if I wished always to be able to rely on them. Practice, and especially the practice of the great slow scale, is the only cure for all injuries, and at the same time the most excellent means of fortification against all over-exertion. I sing it every day, often twice, even if I have to sing one of the greatest roles in the evening. I can rely absolutely on its assistance. If I had imparted nothing else to my pupils but the ability to sing this one great exercise well, they would possess a capital fund of knowledge which must infallibly bring them a rich return on their voices. I often take fifty minutes to go through it only once, for I let no tone pass that is lacking in any degree in pitch, power, and duration, or in a single vibration of the propagation form. End of section 30